fellow students, here today to talk to you about the importance of measurement. Okay, um, the first two things I want to talk to you about are qualitative and quantitative. Qualitative, a qualitative measurement is going to describe something as skinny or maybe fast. Um, qualitative is a quality something has, like being skinny, fast, tall, thin. It's a descriptive word. Okay, quantitative is going to use a number. Um, there's going to be some kind of number assigned, such as temperature. Okay, or assigning something a six mile per minute pace. Okay, it's mathematical. So, for example, if I'm trying to describe these three sets of sticky notes that I have here, um, if I were using qualitative, I would say that this one is taller than this one, or I could say that this one is thinner and smaller than both of the other ones. Um, what else can I say? I could say that this one is rectangular and these ones are square. This one is a smaller square than this one. They're different colors. So all of those things are qualitative. I'm describing a quality that they have. But if I tried to measure the difference, let's see, this one from this angle, I would say is maybe like 0.6 centimeters tall. So that's a quantitative value. I'm saying that it's that many centimeters tall and actually probably less than that based on the edge, maybe 0.5. And this one is about five centimeters wide. Okay, I'll show you that. Five centimeters wide. Okay. And this one, in comparison, is about 7.4 centimeters wide and geez, barely half a centimeter tall. Okay. So these ones are actually about the same height but much different widths. This one's 7.4 and then this one is 2 centimeters wide. So I'm giving them, assigning them quantitative values, giving them a numerical value that describes them. Something else we're going to cover a lot in chemistry is scientific notation. Scientific notation, um, why? Why do we use scientific notation? Hopefully you have an idea. Um, think about it for a minute. Yeah, it's for really, really big or really, really small numbers. For example, Jupiter's volume is this many numbers kilometers cubed. Okay, cubic kilometers. Uh, let's see, one thousand million billion trillion. I don't even know what that is. Okay, is really big. You can fit something like 1,300 um, Earths inside Jupiter. Okay, so that's the volume. So to deal with a really big number like this, we put it into scientific notation, really because, you know, scientists are lazy. So the way you do that, you put a decimal in between the first two numbers. Okay, and then we erase all of these zeros, and we multiply it by 10, to the number of places that we just moved. So we went one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. So the mass of Ju the volume of Jupiter, excuse me, volume of Jupiter is 1.43 times 10 to the 15 cubic kilometers. Okay, another example would be the mass of a proton, which is 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms. Okay, so that's a very, very small number because this is negative. So how do we go from scientific notation the other direction? Okay, we know that this number is going to be very, very tiny. Let's start over to the right because we know that this is the number. 
Okay, and this is where our decimal was. So we need to add 27 zeros. Now, I don't even think I want to add that many zeros. 5, 6, 8, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. What we're doing actually is adding 27 spaces to this. So we have 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. Let's see if we have enough. Okay, so we had our decimal here originally. So now we count how many places we're going. One, two, three, four. Oh, good. I'll start again. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. So there, right there, I'll do it in a different color, right there is our new decimal. Okay, That is the mass of a proton, this dude right here. It's the mass of a proton taken out of scientific notation. So is it not obvious? Why we put things in scientific notation, isn't it a million times easier to put it like this? I think it is. So part two in this lecture is going to be a little bit about accuracy and precision. Okay, uh, here we have a little bit of uh, Wikipedia action for you guys. It was the easiest way for me to find these little target demonstrations. So um, accuracy which I will type out the definition for you guys so you can have my definition. It depends on the measuring device. Oh no, it's in white. Fix that. Okay, device. Okay, accuracy. Wow. Accuracy depends on the measuring device. Okay, whereas precision is getting multiple measurements that are all close. Okay. Or in other words, how consistently how consistently something measures to a value. Those are my definitions of accuracy and precision. I'm going to highlight them. Okay. These are my definitions of accuracy and precision. Write those down. Pause if you have to while I'm coloring this in. These are my definitions for accuracy and precision. Okay. This all comes out of significant figures. How accurately and how precise we can measure something. Okay. So what exactly is the difference? I don't have. Um, I don't have a way to demonstrate it to you except to show you on this little analogy here with uh, targets. Say that if something is highly accurate but not very precise, it, show, it says that something is getting close to the right answer, but all of these little answers, so to speak, are not all precise. They're not all in the same area. Okay? But they're also very accurate because they're right around the target. On the other hand, high precision but low accuracy, all of these are very precise. They're all getting in the in you know a very close range. If you're someone who actually does archery or target practice, you know that this is a really good thing to have happen because you're precise. You're, all of your shots are aiming in the same place. They're all coming to the same location, but they're not very accurate. So all you really have to do is move them over slightly for it to be accurate. I want to weigh the apple. And so what I brought with me today is I brought three scales. I've got a cheap uh, scale um, that costs approximately $100. I've got a, a slightly more expensive one, 300 actually, triple. And then I happen to have a very expensive balance, approximately $800. And I'm going to put the apple onto three different scales. So I'm going to put the apple on the first scale. 
All right, and I'm going to read the balance. I can see the balance. It's probably hard to see the video. And it weighs 132.2 grams. All right? So we would actually say that this is accurate to, let me write this down here, the number of sig figs to four sig figs. Sig figs, SF. All right? Now I'm going to take the apple and I'm going to place the apple onto the medium price balance. Okay. Now has the apple changed its mass? Should be the same. It's the same mass. You didn't take a bite. What? I see a different number on hmm. my balance. I see that it weighs 132.18 grams. Now has the apple changed its mass? Well, it looks like it lost 0 0.02 grams. Yeah, I'm looking at these numbers. Yeah, that looks like it, but can it lose mass? No, not just sitting there. Not just sitting there. So what we're actually saying is that this balance um, is only accurate to four significant figures. Mm -hmm. This balance would be accurate to five significant figures. Oh, and it costs more, so you pay more money per sig fig. You get more money per significant digit. That's correct. Or sig fig or significant digit, same, same thing. These two numbers are actually the same number. They're measuring the exact same quantity. You're paying for the extra digit. If you think about this number, the 132, it is actually rounded, isn't it? It is. It is a rounded number of the 0.18. Now if I go to my expensive balance, and so if I place it on the expensive balance, and I read its reading, I get 132.184 grams. So for the $800 balance, I paid more money for the extra digit. And the 0.18 is actually rounded of this number, isn't it? Oh, yeah. So they round, this number rounds to this, which rounds to this. And of course we would say that this is accurate to six significant figures. And you see, we're actually measuring the same thing. Scientists and mathematicians kind of look at the numbers a little bit differently. When you see 132.2, your math teacher would probably say 132.200000, right? Or something like that. That's what you would think. That is wrong when you do measurements. Actually, every number Every number that's a measurement is a rounded number, and the measuring device can get it less and less rounded, but to all numbers are rounded. So, thank you, Mr. Bergman. As he said, um, every measurement is a rounded number, so we can only get closer and closer and closer to an actual accurate number. The, the more expensive our scale, the better measurements we have. Um, the more uh, little tick marks we have on our ruler, the better we can go about measuring something and getting a more accurate reading. So that's all tied into significant figures, which I'll show you the rules for now. So here are the rules that you need to know when counting significant figures. I'm going to give you a lot of practice, and we'll be working on this all year. It's going to be really important. I'm going to hold you guys accountable for using significant figures and significant digits for all of the work that you turn in. So make sure that it's always correct. Rule number one, all non-zero numbers, so one through nine, are always significant. You always count them. Rule number two, any zero that is between two non-zero numbers, so if you have 503, that zero is significant. Number three, all zeros which are simultaneously to the right of the decimal point and at the end of the number are always significant, okay? So let's see, to the right of a decimal point and at the end of a number, okay? So there is to the right of a decimal point right there and then at the end of a number right there. Both of those zeros are significant because we're using them as placeholders that we were able to measure out to the hundredths place, okay? That's the hundredths and that's the tenths place. I'm having a hard time because I'm using my mouse to draw. Anyway, and our fourth rule, all zeros which are to the left of a decimal point and are in a number are always significant. So, and if they're greater than 10. So, for example, actually, I'm going to grab my little doodly thing here. Okay. So, for example, we have the number 1. Let's see. That number is 10,001. 10,001. Um, all of these zeros on this side, the placeholders, are significant.
Again, when you're adding or subtracting or whatever, you can only solve to your least accurate measurement. Let's see. So just a quick example. If I'm adding 1.01 grams plus 1.22201 grams and let's see, 1.201 grams. Okay, I'm adding these. Okay, so I'm gonna add little placeholders in here just so that I can add them correctly. How many are there? Three, four, five. Okay, just so I can add these right. So, because it doesn't look very straight. It doesn't look like I've done it very evenly. So then one, two, three, four, and then two, and four, point three. Okay, so I'm adding these numbers. These three numbers, the original numbers, all had different numbers of significant figures. Um, this original one was only done out to three. This one was out to one, two, three, four, five, six, six significant figures. Okay. And then this one was only one, two, three, four. So my least accurate measurement was this one, three. So I need to have three significant figures. Okay. And I don't round up because this is less than five, as you guys should remember. So my answer for this was 3.4. Oops, 3.42. Sorry. 3.42. Okay?